Um, this is the lovely Angela Council. And Angela is a leading naturopath and menopause coach. So she is going to be talking about understanding the menopause brain um, and something I'm very interested in because my memory is <laughs> far from what it was. Let's say that. I'll hand it over to you, Angela. Okay, dope. So yes, you are not crazy. It is menopause. And just before I start, I do want to acknowledge the original people of the country on which I live and work, the Garamagile people. Throughout Australia, I recognise and respect First Nations people's culture as the oldest continuous culture on the planet. I honour the diversity of these cultures and all elders and knowledge holders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and welcome any other Indigenous people who might be here with us today. So, have you ever wondered if you're going crazy, <laughs> there's something wrong with you? Maybe you like walk into the room and you kind of go, why am I here? Or your moods are switching at the drop of a hat. You know, one minute the person in front of you, you're so in love with them and the next minute you just want to kill them. Maybe you're expressing anxiety or depression or you just feel sad for no reason also hot, hot flushes they are associated with your brain as well i'm going to explain that a little bit later and don't forget about the head, foggy headedness and all that goes with that the forgetfulness as we mentioned sleep issues or maybe you've had a parent who either has or had alzheimer's disease and this creates a fear in you that you might be heading down the same path. Well, I want you to know you're not crazy. There's a reason for it. And in today's presentation, I'm gonna share with you the role that hormones are playing in your brain function. And most importantly, the steps that you can take to protect your brain as you age. Now, just quickly before I jump into the presentation, I really just wanna introduce myself. So my name is Angela Council. I'm an naturopath. I'm a menopause coach. And I'm also a postmenopausal woman. And I'm on a mission to educate as many women as possible that it is possible to move through menopause with ease. I want to educate women on what is happening to their body, to their hormones, so they can embrace this time of life. On a personal level, I've got husband, I've got two kids. One's already left home. He's at university in Canberra. The other one's doing HSC right now. Um, I've got a Labrador called Bear, who sometimes can be a challenge in himself. I love hiking in the bush and when I'm feeling really stressed, the best thing for me is to pull my hiking boots on, to go to the bush that's right behind our house and just disappear for a couple of hours and it really helps to clear my mind. But that's enough about me. Let's talk a little bit more about your brain and what's happening as your hormones shift. But before I get right into this, I just want to do a quick overview. I'm not sure what's been spoken about before, but I do just want to do a quick overview on the different phases of the menopause journey. So there's four phases of the menopause journey. We start with um, very early perimenopause, and that can start in your late 30s, early 40s. Most women don't realise that things start that early. Generally last between two to five years, and this is when your cycles can start to shorten. So your cycle is from day one of bleed to day one of bleed. So sometimes you can find you get shorter cycles. They may be 21, 26 days rather than the 28 to 30 days. You um, do start to get a drop in progesterone. And this is due to um, a, a loss of egg quality. And because progesterone is going down, you, can, you then actually end up with a little bit more um, estrogen as opposed to progesterone, and that can lead to heavier periods, increased period pain, migraines, and sleep problems. Then we move into um, early menopause, which is phase two. And this starts around the mid-40s and can last up to five years. And this is when your cycles become a little bit more irregular. Progesterone is even lower again because now you're missing ovulation. So you don't ovulate every single month because you're running out of egg supply. Um, estrogen is fluctuating up and down and when it drops, uh, when it drops really low, this is when we start to experience different symptoms, which we will be talking about. Um, then we get into uh, phase three, which is late a perimenopause transition. And this phase can last up to four years. And this is when you can start to miss periods and you can go for months without having um, a period at all. But 
the symptoms that could be getting worse are night flushes, night sweats. They can actually be getting a little bit worse, but any breast pain that you had should be starting to ease at this stage. And you may still be having a few heavy periods, but know that when that's happening, you're getting very close to the end. And then we get into phase four, which is known as the menopause transition. And this is the time after you, you're basically waiting to see if your last period was the last period. This time takes 12 months. So 12 months from the time of your last period, that's your menopause transition. Once you've gone 12 months, you are now postmenopausal. So basically, um, menopause is really just a line in the sand. It's, it's the day 12 months after your last period. So before that, you're perimenopausal. After that, you're postmenopausal. So it's just kind of this line in the sand. And um, I like to refer to all of this as a transition or a journey. And generally, once you move through this menopause transition and you're postmenopausal, then your hormones settle themselves back down. And that uh, generally will result in a lot of your symptoms disappearing. Now, I also quickly want to review what's going on with cycles. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's covered this, but I'm going to do it really, really quickly. What you've got on the screen right now is what a so-called normal cycle would look like. Um, we've, with the red line, we've got estrogen, and basically it starts low at the beginning of the, the cycle, so day one when you're bleeding. It peaks in the middle of the cycle, which is when you ovulate, and then it drops itself back down again. And then with progesterone, it stays low for the first half of the cycle. Once um, you ovulate and release an egg, then progesterone starts to rise. And it's the egg that actually produces the progesterone. So this, and that's really important to know is that it's like, it's not the ovaries producing the um, progesterone. Ovaries produce estrogen, but the egg produces progesterone. So the less eggs we have, the, the more our progesterone levels come down. So progesterone goes up and then at the end of um, your cycle you're either pregnant if you're pregnant progesterone continues to go up for the next three months uh, until um, the placenta hormones take over or if you're not pregnant progesterone just drops back off again and then you bleed and we've got testosterone which is kind of had a little bit of a bump in the middle of the cycle because um, at least lifts your libido because that's when you've released an egg and you're ready um, your body's ready to um, fall pregnant so that's what a so-called normal cycle looks like. And many women don't actually have a cycle like that, but I'm not going to go too much into the issues that happen with women's cycles because uh, I don't have enough time tonight or today. But this is what happens um, when we get closer into these perimenopause stages. So the first half of this um, diagram is basically just showing a consistent regularity within the cycle. But then as we get closer and closer to menopause, we start to see that things shift. So we can see if we look at the, um, the dotted line, um, the blue dotted line, we can see that it's kind of going up and down. There's this real roller coaster. There's a little bit of a downward shift, but then it goes up and then it's going down. And this is um, generally what causes a lot of the symptoms. And this is what we're going to be talking about today is this up and down of um, estrogen and um, in particular the hormone estradiol which I'll explain in a minute then you can see with progesterone that basically it comes low then we have a couple of peaks as we've got you know we release one or two eggs and then generally it um, lower it comes back down and you will notice that we don't go to no hormones um, after we've passed through that um, that menopause stage um, we still have hormones and even though our ovaries are no longer producing hormones um, there's other organs and there's other tissue within the body can actually produce this hormone so we don't go to no hormones we don't go to a lower state of hormones because we don't require the same level of hormones that we needed when we're reproducing because we've got, we're not producing eggs we don't have the possibility of falling pregnant and all of that so uh, tonight I'm going to, or sorry tonight, today, I don't know what time it is, I've been in a conference all day so um, I've kind of I've jumped out of that conference to come on to this one. So today we're going to be focusing on um, what's going on with um, estrogen as you're coming through perimenopause. So we talk about the brain. There's three common imbalances that affect brain health during the menopausal transition. And these are the changes in hormones, poor sleep, which often are, is also related to um, the hormones, as well as being related to diet, lifestyle and stress, and also a lack of self-care. And that is putting your needs 
behind the needs of others. And this is very big for so many women. And all three of these factors affect each other. For example, poor sleep leads to forgetfulness um, and that leads to more stress. And then that, that actually impacts our hormones. So it, it, they all, they're all interrelated. And many of your symptoms that you're experiencing will become more severe the more stressed you are and the more these three things are out of balance with each other. So you kind of get caught up in this, this roller coaster of a menopause transition. And this is why a lot of women think that uh, menopause is going to be tough, it's going to be a struggle. And But what I'm going to share with you tonight or today is that um, it doesn't have to be a, a struggle. Um, but let's start with what's happening with your hormones and how that impacts your brain. Now, a lot of um, what I'm going to share with you tonight is um, from the research of Dr. Lisa Moscone. Um, she's a neuroscientist um, based in the US, and um, she's doing a lot of research on the connection between the brain and the reproductive hormones, and particularly the impact that menopause has on the brain. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some of her work as well as um, some other work here today. So research shows us, and we know this from the research, that women have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease than men, also a higher risk of anxiety, migraines and depression. And this is due to the way our brain interacts with our hormones. And during perimenopause, that, that perimenopause stage, particularly the later half, um, the brain goes through a major rewiring and recalibration due to the shifting hormones. And it's this rewiring and recalibration that's actually the cause of many of the symptoms that are often associated with menopause. We tend to, you know, we've always kind of blamed the fact that the ovaries are no longer producing the hormones. So we're kind of blaming the ovaries and our reproductive system, but we now know that it's actually a lot of this is coming from the brain. So symptoms such as hot flushes, night sweats, insomnia, uh, memory lapses, anxiety, all of these we now know start within the brain and then neurological symptoms. And this is a really important bit of research because it does mean that we do need to be looking after our brain um, as we age. Now, the brain and the ovaries, um, both together form part of what's known as the neuroendocrine system. So neuro means brain, endocrine is um, the system, the hormonal system. So it's called the neuroendocrine system. And the brain communicates with the ovaries and the ovaries respond back to the brain. So there's this two-way conversation going on all of the time. And the health of the ovaries are directly related to the health of the brain. So we, and this, we really need to make sure that we kind of keep this connection going, particularly um, whilst we are still in that reproductive cycling. So the ovaries um, produce, a, it's a form of estrogen. Estrogen is like an umbrella term and under um, estrogen, we've got different types of estrogen. And today I'm going to be talking about estradiol. And this particular hormone, estradiol, is required for healthy energy production within the brain. And as you move through perimenopause, as you saw in that previous um, image where I've had that roller coaster kind of going up and down, um, the ovaries start to slow down the production of estradiol and then they boost it up and then they drop it down. And this all impacts the, the brain and it impacts the way our brain is working. So low estradiol causes the brain neurons to sl start slowing down and aging faster. And this process um, of the low estradiol and the, the, the aging faster of the brain can lead to the formation of plaques within the brain. And we do know that um, with plaque comes an increased risk of Alzheimer's. But it's important to know that the presence of plaque within the brain doesn't guarantee that you're going to develop Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of more ongoing research that's trying to determine what the other factors are that contribute to someone actually developing Alzheimer's. Now, we do know there's a genetic part to it. We also know food plays a really big role. So don't be scared of the fact that just because, it's because estrogen or estradiol is coming down and you're developing more plaques is not 
it doesn't mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's. There's many things that you can do to reduce your risk. And I'm going to be talking about that. Now, estradiol communicates with different areas of the brain. So as estradiol drops, then these different areas of the brain are impacted. So I'm going to go through some of the different areas of the brain and kind of show you how that's impacted. And then you'll get an idea of where these symptoms come from. So starting with the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus regulates your blood te temperature, so your body temperature. So when the levels of estradiol drop, we're not getting as much estradiol going to the brain, to the hypothalamus. So what do you think happens? The brain can't regulate the body temp temperature properly. We have a hot flush. Now, the brainstem, it controls your sleep and your wake cycle. So when estradiol isn't communicating properly with the brainstem, then you have sleep issues. And then the amygdala, which is uh, to do with our emotional center of the brain, when estradiol doesn't activate that part of the brain, we have mood swings. And then we look at the hippocampus and it's all about our memory. So obviously we know that when um, estradiol levels are low, we have these forgetfulness, these episodes of forgetfulness. And so while the, you know, the loss of estradiol, can, it can result in up to 30% of loss of brain energy. But it's really important to know that just because the, you know, we're losing some brain energy and the brain's rewiring itself, it doesn't mean you're losing cognitive performance. Women are still as smart as they've always been. Even though sometimes it might feel like you're not, your brain is still working properly. So it's important to be aware that your brain, like your body, is changing with this downward shift of hormones and you're not going crazy. Now, it does take the body some time to adjust because we've got to remember that there is, you know, it, we are supposed to go through this stage of life. This Every single woman goes through menopause. We're all supposed to go through this gradual decline in hormones. And as we go through the gradual decline in hormones, the body adjusts, the body adjusts and the brain adjusts. Um, and so it's just when we understand that, that this is a temporary thing, what's going on is a temporary thing. And I'll be sharing with, with you some things that can you know, bring down your symptoms. But what we want to do is make sure we're supporting the brain and the body so that as it goes through this transformation, that it's as healthy as it can be as it comes out the other end. Now, Interestingly, what they found is that HRT doesn't actually stop these changes that happen in the brain. It doesn't stop the rewiring and the realignment that's going on. So taking HRT will not stop these changes happening. Whilst they may stop some of the symptoms, it's not changing the way the brain is transforming. There's an evolutionary reason for why this transformation takes, hope, takes place but we're not fully aware of what that is, is yet. There, there is a reason for it, but you know, there's still a lot more research going on around that. So as I said earlier, once your hormones settle in that postmenopausal stage, most of your symptoms disappear because your body has got used to being able to cope without having as much hormones. But the, the news isn't all bad. Um, there's so many things that you can do to support your brain function and, and increase brain energy, even though the hormones are on a downward trend. And we start with food. My naturopath, nutritionist, it's always about food. It's always about food. Um, eating the right type of foods for your body. And this includes eating lots of plant foods, natural foods, foods which are known as phytoestrogen foods. So phytoestrogen foods are plants that have estrogen-like substances that when we eat them, they actually help to um, increase our, the um, uptake of estrogen by the cells. So these type of foods are things like there's, there's flax seeds, sesame seeds, um, dried apricots, legumes, mel melons. You know, there's a lot of foods which help to naturally support the estrogen levels. You know, we still want them on a downward slide because that's where we're going towards, you know, we don't need as much hormone, but it does support and it makes the, 
the cells in the body more sensitive to estrogen, so it'll uptake more estrogen. Um, other um, foods which are really great for supporting the brain are all of your healthy fats. Um, the brain um, really, really th thrives on healthy fats and things like oily fish, nuts and seeds, especially walnuts. And if you've ever looked at a walnut, it looks like a little brain. And then, you know, um, we've got this thing called the um, doctrine of signatures that food can tell us what, um, what part of the body it's actually good for. So we know walnuts are great for the brain. It looks like a brain that's full of really healthy um, fats as well. Also, um, water. Water is so, so important. The brain is made up of 90% water. The body's made up of 70% water, but 90% is in the brain. So when you're dehydrated, it will affect your brain function. It will affect your brain um, energy. It will affect your cognition. So make sure that you're really well hydrated. And that's drinking you know, enough fluids during the day to hydrate your body and your brain. Now, exercise. Um, there's a lot of research around um, the benefits of exercise and um, reducing um, neurological um, disorders like depression and things like that. So exercise is great because what it does is it pushes blood up to the brain um, and then it really, you know, you release all these endorphins, feel good and all of that. So moving your body and, you know, is there a best way to exercise? The best way and the best type of exercise is the exercise that you will do. Um, so exercise that you enjoy doing. As I said before, for me, it's getting, you know, pulling on some hiking boots and jumping into the, um, going into the bush and just disappearing and scrambling over rocks and things like that. That's what I enjoy, enjoy doing. Some people might love going for a, a run. Um, not my thing. I used to run it. My body's just not made to run. But understanding what your body gets benefit out of and what you're doing and exercising. But it's not over-exercising because too much exercise is a stress. We're just going to get the right type and amount of exercise. Um, and, and also, um, when we exercise more, we then um, actually reverse something which is called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance can also affect our brain. Um, sleep. Now, I could stand here and talk to you on how to get a good night's sleep for two hours. So I'm going to try to condense it down into a few minutes. Um, sleep is such a big topic. And a lot of women, as they come through this time of life, do have problems sleeping. And part of it is due to a drop in progesterone because progesterone levels, uh, progesterone hormone is very calming and it helps us sleep. And as progesterone comes down, we do tend to have um, some issues with sleep. But there's generally the problem with people's um, poor sleep is to do with sleep habits. And it's about getting good habits and understanding um, cortisol, which is our stress hormone, and melatonin, which is our sleep hormone, they kind of work um, in reverse to each other. So when cortisol is high, melatonin is low. When melatonin is high, cortisol is low. Now, ideally, cortisol is high in the beginning of the day, and by the end of the day, it's quite low because that's when melatonin comes up. So, But what happens for most people is they're still quite stressed at the end of the day, so their cortisol levels are still too high. So melatonin won't come up, so they're not tired, or they go to bed and their mind is racing. So there's a few things you can do to kind of help get this balance going on. Um, number one, um, a, a good sleep actually starts the morning of the day before. And that's actually getting out and getting good quality sunlight because we have this gland right in the middle of our brain called the pineal gland. And it determines, basically tells the body if it's daytime or nighttime. So we really need to give some help to our body because we can spend a lot of time indoors under fluorescent lights and um, even at nighttime and the brain and the LED lights and all of that, the brain thinks it's still daytime. So because that gland is in the middle and it's getting all this light and it's going, oh, it's daytime and you know it's nighttime and you want to, then all of a sudden you want to go to bed. So we need to kind of get this pineal gland back, back in balance. And the best way to do that to start with is to go outside in the morning, in the sunlight, few minutes of you know sunlight to kind of wake your body up to say now it's daytime. Then at nighttime is to actually lower a lot of your light. So rather than having LED lights and fluorescent lights, all the bright, you know, blue, blue lights going on, 
it's to lower them down or cover them and get them with an orange tint or if you can you can get some filters which would kind of make them orange um, lights same as on your screens as like put filters on your screens and things like that to make everything orange because what that does is tell that gland that it's nighttime or you're going into nighttime and then it starts to shift those hormones for you. So um, there's some, there, they are some um, tips. There's quite a few, as I said, I could talk on sleep for hours. Um, also reducing your environmental toxins. Um, environmental toxins, a lot of them can actually pass what's called the blood brain barrier. So these are toxins that go into the, um, into the body and there we actually have the, a protective barrier that only certain things can actually get through into the brain. But a lot of these toxins that we're consuming that come into our body from our personal care products, from you know, the cleaning products and things that we use can actually pass through that um, blood brain barrier. Um, so, but we I, redu reducing the exposure to them. We can't get rid of them completely, but where can you change where you're being exposed to these toxins? Now, the biggest one, um, stress, reducing stress in all forms. Now, stress um, is physical. It comes in the, the foods that you're eating, the way you're moving your body. It's emotional. So it's what you're talking to your, um, you know, it, you, the fight you're having with your family and the things like that, the mental, all the, the busyness that's going on, the spiritual of your connection to something greater than yourself. It's, you know, it's, it's about kind of, letting go and, um, and making some change because this stress that's going on in our lives is impacting you and it's impacting all parts of your body, including your brain. Now, a really big one that I just do want to note um, is um, eliminating alcohol. And I know that a lot of women go, oh my God, but I love my glass of wine. Unfortunately, alcohol is toxic to the brain. It crosses the blood brain barrier. Too much alcohol will kill you and it stops the production of healthy brain energy. And sometimes simply completely cutting out alcohol is enough to get rid of all of the symptoms associated with menopause and or perimenopause and menopause. There's a couple of other things you can do is just to um, help your brain function is to write things down. So, you know, rather than trying to remember things, knowing that, you know, you don't have, you know, you've got a little bit less energy in that brain, keep a list of the things that you need to remember. Um, don't rely on your memory. Take the pressure off. Also, whilst you're writing, try daily journaling. Um, this, you know, journaling of writing down your deeper emotions and um, desires and um, letting go of stuff. The physical act of writing in a journal actually sets up new neurological pathways, and your brain's already in this time of transformation. So this is a really great way. It's a good time to actually be able to set down some new pathways. And also along with that comes meditation. And research has shown that meditation also helps with rewiring of the brain. And as I said, you know, this is what the brain's going through. So let's help it. Meditation is an excellent way to support the brain. And that doesn't mean that you have to go and sit in the corner cross-legged and go, oh, mm. there's different ways of meditating. Um, meditation for me is going out in the bush hiking. So meditation could be, you know, going out and spending time in nature. Some people um, will need a guided meditation. If you're new to meditation, it might be great to kind of listen to a guided med meditation. And the Insight Timer app is a great place to start with that. But your mindset also plays a significant role in the way you're able to move through this time of life. And if you're the belief that perimenopause, menopause are going to be really tough, well, pretty sure it will be. But if you want it to be different, look around and look for evidence of other women who are thriving in this time of life. Now, this summit today, you will be hearing from them, being with women who are great examples for you. Learn from them. What are they doing? What can you take from them so that you can actually thrive in the next stage of life? So everything I've talked about today, the connection between your ovaries and your brain, the role that estradiol plays in the way that your brain functions, and the steps you can do to not only support your brain, but also your health, it's very important to be aware that this rewiring and recalibration of the brain takes about five years. And this is how long it takes to set up these new neural pathways. 
So rather than the brain connecting with the ovaries, which it had been doing throughout your reproductive life, now what happens is the brain now reconnects back to, well, it, it has a stronger connection to your adrenals. So your adrenal glands do have the ability to produce hormones. It can produce progesterone and it can make estrogen. So now this is now why the brain now goes to the adrenal glands to get its um, source of um, estrogen. And and this is one of the reasons why many women have symptoms because by the time they come to this time of life, they're highly, highly stressed and their adrenals are exhausted. So it's really important that we address the adrenals and that we support the adrenals. But the main message I want to share with you today um, is that your menopause transition is a time of change. So not only are your hormones changing, your body is changing, and now you understand that your brain is changing as well. And like any change, it takes time to adjust to a new normal. But once the hormones settle at that new steadier, lower level, both the body and your brain will adjust. There's no need to have the same amount of hormone that you had before when you were ovulating every month and your body was preparing it for pregnancy. So it's okay to have a lower level of hormone. So regardless of what you know, people tell you and that you need to add more hormones back, the body is able to produce the right amount of hormone that it requires. And as I said, we can produce estrogen and progesterone from other, uh, particularly estrogen, we can produce from other cells, other organs um, in the body. So we, the body still is able to produce those hormones so long as we support it. So you might have to do things a little bit differently to what you've done before because you probably already realised what you're doing before doesn't necessarily work um, now. Um, so it's like, what? How can I do things differently? Do I need to look at the foods I'm eating? What? What is it? What do I need? What does my body need? What? What am I? You know, where am I ready to change? Because this truly is for you a window of opportunity. This is your opportunity to create the health that you want for the rest of your life. Now, all of you are somewhere in the middle of your life right now, you know, and depending on how, I mean, we don't know how long we're going to live, but let's imagine we're going to live to, you know, 90 plus years. At 45, you're halfway there. This is when, the, you know, the peak of women are kind of coming through this perimenopause stage. This is your opportunity to create what you want for the next half of your life. The, the health that you want for the rest, the rest of your life, the brain that you want, the life that you want. So this is your opportunity. And as I mentioned before, this is all about transformation. And I like to use the story of the caterpillar, the caterpillar that goes into the cocoon and basically has to completely break down and go down to mush to then recreate and transform into a butterfly. And then the butterfly has to break out of the chrysalis. Now, if you come along and you cut the chrysalis and to kind of help the butterfly, the butterfly's wings don't get strong and then the butterfly will die. It's the actual breaking out of the chrysalis that strengthens the butterfly's wings and allows it to grow, it allows it to get strong, allows it to fly. This is what this transition is for you. Yes, there's gonna be some tough times, but it's that those tough times that are going to strengthen you are going to give you the resilience so that you can spread your wings and fly. But if you don't make the changes to your diet, to your lifestyle right now, as your body is going through this time of transformation and change, it will be harder to do once you get older and you increase your risk of chronic diseases like Alzheimer's disease, heart disease and other diseases as, as, as well. And as you age, you know, what seems to happen for many people, and I don't want this for you, is that you get one health crisis and then that leads to the next health crisis and then another and then another. And we have women, we have women in there, you know, going through their late 60s right through to their 80s and beyond who are basically just moving from one condition to another. They spend their entire time seeing doctors, being diagnosed with one thing after the other. That doesn't have to be your story but this is your time to make the changes so that isn't your story. Comes down to it, it's all up to you.
Now, just before I want to finish up, before I take questions, um, I do have a free a gift for you. Um, my Understanding Hormones e-course. It's valued at $197. Um, and it's just a, it's a few different videos and some workbooks and things like that to take you through in a more detail on what's happening with your hormones at this time of life, not just estrogen and progesterone. I go into other hormones as well. Plus, you'll also be put on the wait list for the next round of my Understanding Menopause workshop. Um, and yeah, you go on the wait list for that. Next one will be run early next year. Um, and um, that's worth $197 as well. So you get two, two freebies. $197 and the list, the link is on the screen right now. So angelacouncil.com forward slash um hyphen workshop hyphen wait list. So uh, that will actually take you to the understanding menopause wait list workshop. Once you sign up for that, you'll then get um, the e-course as well. That will get emailed to you um, over the next few days. So as we're kind of coming to the end, are there any questions? Um, now, Vanessa, I can't see questions. Oh, can I? I'm on this screen. I might be able to see them. Hang on. Just let That's me see. Just... Oh, yes, I can see them on this screen. Sorry, if I'm looking, I've got another screen over here. So and my camera's there. So that's OK. Um, if there's any questions, please just let me know. I'll just quickly go through what's going here. Um, someone has rage driving. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I, I don't drive very much these days, particularly not the last two years because we've been in lockdown. Um, hi, Kylie. How are you? Okay. Is there any questions? Let me have a quick look. Now, Vanessa, Vanessa did... Did that um, question get answered before that you were? Oh, I was just going to say to you, how do you identify symptoms of perimenopause if you're on birth control? Okay. Well, let me explain. When you're on birth control, so our cycle is all about ovulating. People think it's all about the period. The cycle is all about ovulating. So the main event is ovulation. Um, when you're on the pill, you don't ovulate. So basically, you are in a medically induced or chemically induced menopause. So the answer to the question is, whilst you're on the pill, you can't tell. And particularly if you've been on it for quite some time, and really the, the only hormones your body is getting is the synthetic hormones that are coming in because the body has stopped producing its own natural hormones. So you're actually almost, you're actually technically in menopause being on the pill. Mm. Coming off the pill, then that's a different thing because now then you've got a sudden withdrawal of the hormones, even though they're synthetic. And if your body can't then pick up the um, production of natural hormones, you need to do a fair bit of work to pick up the natural production of hormones, then um, women um, have se some, some very severe um, symptoms. And this is a this is an, this is an issue because when we're putting artificial hormones into our body. Now, look, I was on the pill for over 20 years when I was younger, um, and it took a lot of work for me to kind of get my body to work itself again and get itself working um, so that um, I could fall pregnant naturally. And actually, I went from there straight into um, perimenopause because I had my first child at 40 and second and 43. So I kind of went into perimenopause. But um, yeah, so when you're on the pill, the answer, the short answer to the question is no, you can't tell when you're going through perimenopause. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so would you recommend to someone to come off the pill and kind of try and work on their cycle to see what is actually going on with their body or yes. to stay on the pill and just... No, I would recommend that they come off and try and get their body back into a natural cycle. And you can do it. And obviously it does, it depends on the situation. But um, working with a naturopath who can actually help you to rebalance your hormones, get your hormones working, because otherwise you then can't stay on the pill for the rest of your life. There is a risk of that. Um, there is a risk of blood clots. There's a higher risk, uh, depending on which pill you're on. Um, there could be a higher risk of breast cancer and things like that. There's always risk that comes with any medication that you take. Um, but you don't need to be on the pill, um, except for contraceptive purposes, obviously. But yeah, I would recommend that someone came off the pill and um, 
and, and try to rebalance their hormones. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I would imagine that most people <laughs> have taken in so much information that they need a little bit of time to process for questions. <laughs> um, but are you going to join us in the Facebook group after? Yeah, I'm already in the Facebook group. Um, I have been a little bit busy um, the last week or so, so I haven't been around too much, I'm mainly because I've had other things going on. Because um, I'm, as I said, I'm part of a conference at the moment and I've got another, I've got to speak tomorrow. So um, I've been a little bit busy, but yes, I'm in the Facebook group. Okay. I'm there. You can ask questions if you've got any questions and yeah, I'm, I'll be there. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. I will um, give everybody all your contact details again so that, you know, they don't lose it, scribble it down on paper and stuff like that. And we'll see you in the Facebook group when mm -hmm. you are off all these conferences and uh, summits. <laughs> you yeah. have a holiday after all this. Oh, I will. Yeah, but I can't go anywhere. So one day I'll get a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Bye. Okay. Yeah, bye. Okay. So let me just.